Hi everybody, thank you for joining me today. Um, so today we're going to be learning all about turtles. If you have any questions as we go through, feel free, uh, feel free to ask um, any questions that you have. You can put them in the chat box or there's also the question and answer box. Um, and I think Joanna, our stewardship coordinator, should be manning those ones. Um, so she'll let me know about your questions. Okay, so let's learn all about turtles. As you no doubt know, um, here my slides are changing, there we go. Um, the Nature Trust has been working to pr protect the outstanding legacy, the natural legacy of this province through private land conservation for the last 28 years or so. And we do this by finding lands that are ecologically significant and protecting them. And once we protect them, we're also responsible for caring for them and steward stewarding these lands. And one of our projects that we at the stewardship team have that's ongoing is our turtle power project. And I'm going to be telling you a little bit about that today. So in uh, 2020, the Nature Trust successfully applied for three years of funding um, for our Turtle Power Project. And this project has been undertaken with the financial support from the Government of Canada through the Federal Department of Environment and Climate Change Canada. Now, the aim of our Turtle Power Project is to support in the recovery and the conservation of two actress turtle species. Um, and those are the Blandings Turtle and the Wood Turtle. So what have we been doing for our project? So far, we've been continuing to secure ecologically significant properties in areas that have been designated as critical habitat for these species. We've also been doing some on the ground stewardship and conservation work with the help of our lovely volunteers. And I'm going to be telling you a little bit about those projects later on. And also importantly, we provide the opportunity for our volunteers, and our donors and also anyone who's really interested to come and learn about these species at risk and how and the projects that we have and to help in their recovery and their conservation. So in Nova Scotia there are four um, species that of freshwater turtle that are native to this province. Those are the eastern turtle, the common snapping turtle, the wood turtle, and the Blandings turtle. And we're going to be talking about each of these species individually, but before we do that, I want to give you a few general facts about freshwater turtles. So turtles are ectothermic, which means that they don't produce their own body heat and they have to rely on um, the sun to warm, up, to warm up. So that's why you see them, if you're lucky, out basking um, in, in the spring months so they can warm up. Um, throughout a year, they have three critical life history periods. The active season, which is when they're out and about. Um, the nesting season, which is when the females leave the water um, to go on land to nest. And the overwintering or the non-active season. Now, turtles can breed in um, over the winter or early in the spring. And then the females will, from late May until early July, will leave the water and go on land to go and find a nesting site. So females will dig a nest in the ground to lay their eggs in and then cover the nest back over. And this is when the incubation period starts. And the fem uh, female turtles are relying on the sun um, to heat up their eggs so they can develop in the nest. Once they're fully developed, they uh, eggs will hatch out and you have hatchlings and then they'll make their way to water. Uh, to survive the winter, turtles have a specific type of hibernation that they go into. It's called brumation and this is specific to reptiles and amphibians. So what they'll do is they'll tuck themselves away during winter at the bottom of lots of different kinds of water bodies, so like uh, pools or in rivers or they'll dig themselves into um, mud and undercut um, stream banks and they'll stay there for six months. And re they rely on 
stored energy that they collected over the summer and they uptake water, um, uptake oxygen from the water around them. And that's how they breathe. Turtles are also characterized by what is known as a slow life history. So what is this? It means they have long lifespans. They live 50 to 80, 100 plus years. And they also have quite a long um, juvenile period. So the species that we're talking about today, well, it takes them 12 to 25 years to become sexually mature before they can breed and give back into the population. Um, a slow life history is also characterized by a low, um, pardon me, by long generation times. So it's between one generation and the next, it could be 25 to 40 years. If you compare that to say humans, our generation time is 22 to 33 years. So it takes a long time between each generation of turtles. If you add all of this up together, it means that the survival of a population is dependent on having a really high annual adult survival from one year to the next. And losing even a few adult turtles can have a really big impact on the number of hatchlings that are going to be uh, hatch out in the next year. So the first species that we're going to talk about today is the Eastern Painted Turtle. Um, and actually the Painted Turtle is the most common and the most colorful of the freshwater turtles that you get in Canada. So much so that they're actually divided into three separate subspecies. So the Western Turtle, a uh, Western Painted Turtle goes from um, Ontario West over to BC, and then you have the Midland Painted Turtle, and it's in parts of Ontario and into southern Quebec as well. Oh, I have a hand question. And then there is the um, Eastern Painted Turtle, which is in Nova Scotia and in a bit of southern Quebec as well, and into New Brunswick too. So how do you identify Eastern Painted Turtles? Let me skip to my next slide. Here we go. So Eastern Painted Turtles have smooth and gently rounded upper shells, which is also known as the carapace. And it's um, dark green to black in color. And it has lovely red markings along the sides, which you can kind of see in this last previous slide. If my computer won't, here we go. You can see these lovely uh, colors on the sides of the turtle shell. Um, their lower shell, which is called the plastron, is tan to yellow in, co in color and is usually unmarked, but it can have um, a kind of like a dark splodge in the center of the plastron too. Their head and limbs, this, uh, their skin is black to olive in color with yellow and red striping and their shells can grow to a maximum of 19 centimeters. Um, so Eastern Painted Turtles are um, active from April until early October, and they're considered juveniles until they become sexually mature, which is until around somewhere between 12 and 15 years old. Um, Eastern Painted Turtles have are this thing that's called the temperature dependent sex determination. And this is when um, the temperature in the nest actually determines what sex the hatchlings are going to be. So if it's 26 degrees or less, you end up with male hatchlings, or if it's 29 degrees or more, you end up with female hatchlings. If it's in between those temperatures, you get a mix of male and female. And if you think about the structure of the nest, um, you have eggs that are laid further to the top and then there's eggs at the bottom and there's different temperature in like temperature range in, in the nest itself. So you end up with a different sex ratio. Um, Eastern painted turtles live for about 50 years in the wild or so or longer and they have an omnivorous diet. So they eat aquatic insects and larvae as well as snails and small fish and frogs and tadpoles and um, other aquatic vegetation like lily pads. So um, 
In Nova Scotia, they're most commonly found in Gaspitwick, which is southwest Nova, um, which if you're not familiar with it, it's around Kajimkujik kind of national park. And as you move northeast through the province, they become less and less common, so much so that they're not really found in Cape Breton. Um, they typically inhabit shallow and slow moving water with lots of uh, vegetation and soft organic substrates on the bottom. And they like lots of basking sites. So you can find them in um, swamps and marshes and ponds and also in lakes and rivers and brooks, but they tend to avoid the large open deep water areas too. The females will nest in a variety of different substrates, um, including sand and clay and gravel, and they look for areas that have high sun exposure and they need this to incubate their eggs. So they'll nest in um, natural habitats of meadows and riparian shorelines and forest clearings, but they'll also use more anthropogenic sites such as agricultural fields and road, sh road shoulders. Um, Eastern painted turtles face a variety of uh, threats, even though they're such a widespread species. Um, they are currently listed as special concern under the Species at Risk Act. Uh, their primary threat that they face, and indeed that all turtles face, are road networks and vehicles. So there are two reasons that you would find um, turtles out on road on roads. These could be females that are out looking to find a nesting site or it could be um, other turtles like hatchling or juveniles that are traveling over land for migration purposes. Maybe they're um, moving away from a disturbed site or they're trying to get into a different water body. When they're on the road, um, if they're startled by a fast car, what they do as their defense mechanism is pull into their shell and they stay there. And this, unfortunately, is not much use against cars because often they will get hit and they get squashed, um, sadly. Adult females are the most vulnerable to being hit by cars because they go out every year searching for a nesting site. Now, there are also um, indirect threats that, uh, indirect impacts that road networks and vehicles have on turtles too. So, when females are out looking for a nesting site, they can come across um, gravel road shoulders that look like really attractive nesting habitat, except these habitats are falsely attractive because they have many um, negative impacts on the nest and the hatchlings that the female doesn't really recognize or doesn't understand that, they're, that are there. And this is what's called an ecological trap. So some of these negative impacts include something like nest compaction. So say um, a turtle just laid her nest there and it's covered over and then somebody could drive along, not see that it's there and then the nest gets squashed and the eggs get squashed. Another thing that happens on um, gravel roads is very common that nests get exposed and dug up when the roads are getting graded um, and that results in the death of the eggs. Also along roads, there are higher rates of predation from uh, often predators will be traveling all, along the roads looking for roadkill and they'll come across a nest and they dig, her up, dig it up. If, however, a nest survives and the hatchlings actually make it out and emerge, they emerge onto the road and then they have to dodge traffic as they're trying to make their way to a water body. And the hatchlings are very small. They're only about 2.5 centimeters long, which is about the size of a toonie. Other threats that eastern, per eastern painted turtles face are uh, come from forestry and harvesting, and it results in the degradation of the aquatic habitat, as well as cottage development along shoreline habitats. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. The next species that we have is the common painted turtle. Oh, no, pardon me, it's a common snapping turtle. And my computer is slow. Here we go. So the snapping turtle is the largest freshwater turtle that you find in Canada. 
and it has a maximum shell length of 50 centimeters, which when you combine with their big head and they have a long neck and a tail that's almost as long as their shell makes them quite um, intimidating and very large. Their carapace, the upper shell, is brown to olive and black in colour and it has this distinctive sawtooth shape on the back end of their shell. The lower shell is yellow in colour and much smaller than the carapace, so they can't actually pull themselves in to protect themselves in their shell. So instead, they have this large um, head with a hooked upper jaw and strong snapping jaws. And this is what they use to defend themselves. So the snapping turtle is active from May to October and they become sexually mature around the age of 17 to 19 years old. Um, they also display temperature dependent sex determination. So in between temperatures of 23 to 28 degrees, we end up with male hatchlings. But if it's less than 23 degrees and more than 28 in, uh, degrees Celsius in the nest, you end up with female hatchlings. They live for a long time. They can survive 70 plus years in the wild. And they also have an omnivorous diet. And they eat aquatic invertebrates as well as fish and amphibians and they eat a lot of um, dead things in their aquatic habitats too, and plant material. Um, in Nova Scotia, they're most commonly found in Gasputovic, which is Southwest Nova again. And like the painted turtles, um, they inhabit a wide range of freshwater habitats. So they like soft, moving, uh, slow moving water that with soft um, muddy bottoms and lots of dense aquatic vegetation. So you can find them in swamps and marshes, fens and bogs, and also um, lakes and rivers. The females will nest in a mix of different substrates, including sand and soil and gravel. And they also like to look for those open areas with lots of sun exposure. You'll find them in meadows and repairing shorelines, as well as on rock outcrops, and they nest in fields and on road shoulders again. Like the painted turtle, they face a number of threats. Um, and in they are listed as special concern under the Species at Risk Act. So uh, like painted turtles, roads are one of their major sources of mortality to the species. But they also um, face threats from recreational and sport fishing. So they can ingest fishing hooks or sinking or sinkers or other types of fishing gear and get caught in fishing gear. And this can be from um, dead fish or they can get directly hooked by an angler. But they've also faced a long history of persecution. Um, and this means that they've been directly targeted and killed. Um, this is mostly because they have a bad reputation, which is often exaggerated for aggressive behavior. And they have, because they're so large and they're quite fearsome and prehistoric looking, they, ha they have a bad rep. They also have a reputation as being gross predators of, for waterfowl and sport fishing. So, and people don't like that, so they target them. Um, this deliberate persecution and killing of snapping turtles also moves over to um, roads as well. There was a study that was conducted in 2007 near um, Long Point Provincial Park in Ontario. And researchers there put a decoy turtle, so it's like a, a fake dummy turtle, out into the centre of the road. And they, record, they sat out there for a few days and they recorded that out of every 40 vehicles that drove past, one vehicle would deliberately swerve and move to hit the turtle. Um, the snapping turtles also face unnaturally high rates of nest predation. And this is especially true in areas where there are uh, denser populations of humans. And this is because when there are more humans, we create a lot of waste. And this results in a naturally high numbers of predators 
general species such as your raccoons and skunks and coyotes. So these, these predator populations are supported by humans, but then these predators go out and they travel um, into the wild habitats where the turtles are and they eat all the turtle nests. Snapping turtles also face um, the threat of illegal harvesting for the pet trade and also for consumption and also face the threat of environmental contamination where um, contaminants such, such as PCBs actually can cause deformities in the hatchlings. Another threat they face is also ongoing habitat loss and degradation. The next species that we're going to talk about is the wood turtle. So, wood turtles are most easily identifiable by their bright orange color that you see on their legs and on their neck, and also by the carapace, the, the top shell. So it's um, gray brown in color, and it has, has this, uh, it's got this raised edge that travels through the middle of the shell, and each scoot, which is what you call each plate that makes up the shell, has this carved wood-like appearance, and what they actually are is, is concentric growth rings. So the older turtle have more growth rings, except as they get older, the really old turtles, these growth rings start to wear down. Their bottom shell is yellow and it has black splotches along the edges of the splits and their shells grow to a maximum of 25 centimeters in length. And wood turtles can survive 80 plus years in the wild. Now, wood turtles are the most terrestrial of the Nova Scotia freshwater turtle species. So they spend a lot of their time in the summer out um, on land. They become sexually mature uh, around 11 to 22 years of age, but the temperature of the eggs during incubation does not determine the sex of the hatchling in this species. Um, the sex of the hatchling is actually determined by the genetics that they have. Uh, hatchlings will emerge in late August into early October and they have an omnivorous diet. They like to eat forest berries and young leaves from shrubs, especially from alder trees. They eat flowers and fiddleheads from ferns and mushrooms and invertebrates. So, in Nova Scotia, wood turtles are, the largest population of wood turtle is found on the St. Mary's River. And the St. Mary's River has slow moving, um, clear water and it's, all their streams are quite hard bottomed uh, and so are, the, so are the rivers. Um, the St. Mary's River also has lovely floodplain forests and some nice fields and really lovely riparian areas that travel along it. And these are all types of habitat that the turtles will use. The females nest in sandy and gravelly substrates, um, such as along the beaches and the banks of the river, but they also use anthropogenic uh, habitats too, like gravel pits and roads and railways. They will nest there too. Okay, so here is a picture of the St. Mary's River. This is overlooking um, Crow's Nest, which is a Nature Trust conservation land. And you can see down in the bottom left-hand corner, there's an example of uh, some, um, some lovely nesting beaches that the females would use to nest on. I have some more pictures of the habitat that they use here as a wood turtle on another uh, Nature Trust property. This was taken a few years ago. Here's an example of some of the floodplain forest type of habitat they, they would use in the summer. And this type of forest is often cut through with these slow backwater channels that, are, that come off as tributaries to the main river. And the turtles will spend a lot of time in this type of habitat. Now, wood turtles, face many similar threats as to what eastern painted turtle do and snapping turtles. In, um, they're actually listed as threatened under the Species at Risk Act and as threatened under the Nova Scotia Endangered Species Act too. 
Along the St. Mary's River, there's a long history of forestry and agriculture and mining. And that's along the banks of the river and also in the surrounding area. And the combined impacts of these industries have had a major influence on the health of the river and its habitats. And this in turn has had an influence on the wood turtle population. So if we think about trees and the canopies, they, they provide a lot of functions that are important to the health of the river. So they hold soil in place and they also soak up lots of water and the trees also provide um, lots of shade. But the historic conversion of forests into agricultural fields and also current forest harvesting has resulted in a lot of canopy removal along the watershed. And when you remove all of these trees, it has a number of, um, of impacts on the river. So removing trees results in more water ending up in the river at a faster rate than what it would be, and this can cause flooding. And if this happens during the spring months, if there's a big flood, it could actually wash all the way, wash away all of the nests that you saw um, along those nesting beaches. Or if this happens, if there's flooding in the fall, you could actually wash away all of the, the, the hatchlings, they would all get washed down river. Um, if trees are removed, it also results in more sediment getting washed into the river, making the water more turbid, and this degrades the habitat, the, the quality of the habitat. If you remember wood, turtle, wood turtles like really clear water to live in. And removing the canopy also results in a loss of um, water thermal regulation, so the water heats up. And this, not, this might not directly impact the turtles because they can get out and leave, but their, um, this, the aquatic invertebrates that they eat and the fish that then the eggs that they eat that all rely on having a similar temperature uh, to, to live in in the water. Um, the picture that I have here uh, is of a different species of turtle and this is the red-eared slider. This species is native to the southern states and is found around the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and it's a not a native species from Nova Scotia. So if it, but there is the potential that it could be introduced. And if it were introduced into the St. Mary's River, this species of turtle would actually outcompete wood turtles. And this means that the red eared sliders would um, take up more food and more habitat or the same type of habitat and food that wood turtles eat. And they would be eventually, if there was a large enough breeding population of red-eared sliders, they would outcompete the wood turtles. So this is another potential threat that we have to keep an eye out for. So the Nature Trust has been working in St. Mary's River since 2006. And so far we have secured 15 conservation lands along about a 30 kilometer stretch of the river and I have a map to show you. Um, so this means that we've protected nearly 600 hectares or 1,440 acres of land that is never going to be developed and is never going to have a road cut through them and is never going to be harvested. As part of our um, turtle power project, we created a wood, cover, uh, wood turtle recovery guidance document so we looked at all of the best management practices and all of the actions the stewardship team can take to help in the recovery of this species. And then this guidance document was integrated into our stewardship plan. And our stewardship plan is how is a, a document detailing all how we're going to look after all of our conservation lands in this area. But we don't only focus on wood turtle, we also make sure that we're looking after other species that are at risk, including um, endangered mainland moose population and bird species such as the Canada warbler, but also um, bank swallows and eastern wood peewees and the endangered olive sided flycatcher. And of course, there are other species that are in the river that make use of it, such as the endangered um, Atlantic salmon, and also brook trout and uh, gaspero too. So here is the map of nature trust lands, which are outlined, which are in yellow, but outlined in red. 
and this is our Baron Brook property. In um, the pink is the recently protected St Mary's River Provincial Park and this was protected in 2020 and the province, um, this land is, it's, I think it's maybe 11,000 hectares that has been protected from Trafalgar all the way down to Sherbrooke. The property over on the left hand side, I don't know if you can, hopefully you can see my mouse. This is Hardwood Hill and we have an upcoming restoration project that I'm going to tell you about. So the Nature Trust brought, bought Hardwood Hill in 2018 and there's a five a hectare cornfield on the property that has probably been farmed for probably more than 100 years but it was last planted with corn in 2020. In 2021 we planted a cover crop on it of um, clover and other nitrogen fixing species and we did this to rebalance the nutrients in the soil in preparation for a restoration project which is taking place this fall. So our, the goal of our restoration project is to return um, this five hectare cornfield to mature forest. And we're going to do this by planting lots of tree, tree saplings. So we want to plant similar trees that would have been there historically and tree species that are around about in St Mary's River. So we'll be planting red maple and red oak and sugar maple. Um, and in the wetter areas, we'll be planting some willows and speckled alder and black cherry. And we aim to plant 2,000 trees per hectare, so 10,000 trees altogether. And if you're interested, we would super like your help. We need some volunteers to help us plant lots of trees. So here is the field that we will be planting, this five hectare area. And eventually we would like it to look um, exactly like this, uh, forest down on the right hand corner. Here's a bird's eye view. So you can see that the field, the outline of the field, takes up quite a bit, um, quite a large proportion of the property. But once it's replanted, hopefully all our trees will grow up um, and it can be used by root turtles and other species too. My last view of the field here, this is the field we'll be planting with St Mary's River over on the left hand side. And this is the hardwood hill that the property was named after. Janine, yes. can you show the field one more time? There's a request from someone who'd like to see it. Sure thing. From which angle? Hmm. Might as well just show them all for a second. All right. So here it is. I'm not sure when this picture was taken. Probably. It does have a crop in it, so probably a few years ago. Yeah, but it'll be cool. It's a very exciting project that we have planned for there, and we definitely need some help planting trees. So if we're available, please help us. <laughs> um, the last species we're going to talk about is the Blanding's turtle. So they are most easily identifiable by their yellow chin and throat. Their uh, carapace is grey to black in colour and it has um, yellow flecks throughout which are brighter in younger turtles and also when the shell is wet. Their bottom shell, the plastron, is um, yellow with black splotches around the edges of the scutes and their shells uh, as they're at, uh, when they're adults are 18 to 25 centimetres in length. Blanding's turtles are active from April until October and they have the longest uh, juvenile period of any of the species that we talked about and some of them don't become sexually mature until they reach the age of 25. They also have temperature dependent sex determination so in a nest where it's 28 degrees and less, you get end up with males, but if it's 30 degrees and more, you end up with females, and if it's in between those two, you end up with a mix of sexes. The hatchlings emerge in early August into late October, and they have a lifespan of um, over 80 years. They also have an omnivorous diet, eating aquatic 
um, and terrestrial invertebrates and larvae, as well as frogs, toads, and tadpoles, and um, crayfish and carrion, as well as fish and their eggs and aquatic vegetation. So Blanding turtles will use a variety of different um, water habitats over their long lifespan. They're typically found in darkly colored water that has lots of tannins, um, but in shallow water that's less than, two, less than two meters deep, but with lots of vegetation and soft, um, muddy bottoms. So you'll find them in fens and in shallow lake coves, in vernal pools, but also in slow flowing brooks and rivers. And I have some pictures of um, habitat that I can show you. The females will nest in a mix of different uh, substrates, um, as well as soil filled crevices in rock outcrops. So here we have a picture, this is of an nature trust property. You can see um, this darkly colored water and it's quite wet vegetation surrounding. Here is an example of a, a tributary that feeds into another um, larger river system that the turtles would use. We have a nice uh, lily pond with lots of vegetation and basking sites. And this last picture of a blanding turtle is traveling over some slate outcrops. I quite like this picture, so I decided to include it. They also face um, a number of different threats too. So they're all they're found in in around uh, Gisprudwick. So that's think around Kajimakujik. And one of the primary threat threats that they face in that area is actually cottage development. So cottage lot development directly destroys and um, alters and degrades the habitat that is there. But it also weakens habitat connectivity and creates barriers to, uh, to turtle movement. In Nova Scotia, there are thought to be fewer than 500 um, Blanding's turtles left in the wild. And these turtles are actually separated into four um, geographically and probably genetically distinct subpopulations and they're um, in, found in different watersheds. There are a number of associated impacts um, that come with cottage development too. And this, um, these are um, more road networks. So you have to build a road before you can get to the shoreline to build your cottage. Um, and also another impact can be shore stabilization. So you lose the natural shoreline that the turtles depend on uh, to, to live in. When you add more humans into an area, when you have cottage development, you also increase the likelihood that turtles are going to be collected as pets or collected to eat too. And you also increase um, the predator population too, because more humans equals more, more predators. Um, when you have uh, more people, you also increase the likelihood of invasive species introductions too. So the two pictures that we have at the bottom here are of smallmouth bass and chain pickerel. And these are predatory fish, fish species that if they were introduced into Blanding's turtle habitat, they would directly compete for food and resources with Blanding's turtles, but they would also um, eat the hatchlings because the hatchlings are very small and these fish become very big. And both of these species are in Nova Scotia, but I don't think yet they have not yet been recorded in Blanding's turtle habitat. But there are a number of projects that are ongoing to control these invasive, sp invasive fish too. Um, the Nature Trust has been working in Gisprudwick, Southwest Nova, since 2008. And right now we, we steward 13 conservation lands which have um, been designated as critical habitat for the Blanding's turtle. So altogether, we've protected over 400 hectares or almost uh, uh, 990 acres. 
And this is land that is never going to be harvested and is never going to be developed. So it's protected for these turtles. Part of, as part of our turtle power project, we also created um, another recovery guidance document. So we look to see what um, steps and measures the Nature Trust can take to help in the protection of Blanding's turtles. But we also look um, to see what we can do for other at-risk species in, in the area. And this includes um, such species such as uh, the Eastern Ribbon Snake and also Atlantic Coastal Plain Flora. And that's a unique group of unrelated species that are quite rare um, types of flowers that in some instances you find nowhere else in Canada except in, these, in this location in uh, Nova Scotia. So I have quite, uh, it's my map here that I'm showing you is quite vague on purpose because I can't tell you exactly where blanding circles are because they're a protected species. So these are the properties that we have protected so far. One of um, the projects that we've been working on, we've been doing in a partnership with the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute. And the staff and the volunteers at MTRI have been doing um, lots of research on Nature Trust lands on blanding turtles for quite a few years now. So they've been doing nest protection and emergence surveys. So you can see the nest protectors in this picture over in the bottom right hand corner. But they've also been doing population monitoring, which involves quite a few different things, such as trapping and visual surveys and conservation canine surveys. And that's uh, specially trained conservation dogs who can go out and find turtle nests. They've also done some habitat char char characterization on nature trust lands. And they've also done some radio tracking of turtles to see what kind of habitat they're using and where they're going. One of our upcoming projects, we also have an upcoming project that we will be working on together. Um, so I wanted to give you another picture of the nest protectors. You actually need a species at risk permit to use these protectors. That's why the staff at MTRI and the volunteers are doing it. But um, once the females have laid their eggs, these nest protectors are put over the top. And after the incubation period, the nest protectors are checked every day. And what they do is they stop um, predators like raccoons and skunks getting in there to eat the eggs. And once the hatchlings emerge, researchers will take some measurements and they count how many emerge and um, the sexes, and then they are, the hatchlings are left to go back into the water. So the upcoming project that I talked about is actually this starting next week. So in the, the property that we'll be working on is McGowan Lake and there's an area on our McGowan Lake property that up until 2015 was quite regularly used by Blanding's turtles and other species of turtles and they nested in this area but um, vegetative growth has reduced the, avail the availability and the quality of the nesting substrate and also the canopy has closed in and um, cut off a lot of the sun. So our plan, a restoration goal, is to remove this encroaching vegetation and to cut down the covering canopy so it becomes a really nice and inviting nesting site again. So next week, we're going to go and do some tree and shrub removal to cut all of those down. And then um, we will probably go back in early May to go and rake out the soil and the shrubs substrate there to make it a nice nesting spot. And we're going back in early May because this is when, um, when any overwintering painted turtle nests will have hatched out. So what can you do to help at-risk turtles on your land? If you have a cottage property, there are quite a few, uh, which is on the edge of a lake or um, on a river shoreline, there's quite a few things that you can do to help these at-risk turtle species. 
one of the main things you can do is to maintain the natural vegetation around the lake shoreline and on your wetlands, because this is the habitat that the turtles use. Um, if you have a green thumb, you can plant lots of native species. And it's a good idea to reduce your lawns or remove them too. Um, in that vein, it's also a, a good idea to limit or eliminate the use of pesticides and herbicides, as well as chemical fertilizers, because all of this eventually will get washed into the water course and degrade the, the quality of the habitat. You can also build docks that are more um, friendly to shorelines and to turtles. And it's also important that you keep your sewage systems well maintained because you don't want that leaking into the water. Another thing you can do is to properly dispose of your garbage and your waste. And that way you don't help the predator populations get bigger. Um, there's a really useful uh, website that you can visit and it's called A Landowner's Stewardship Guide for Species at Risk in Nova Scotia. And it's a really good resource and it has um, a lot of tips for homeowners and what they can do to help species at risk on their land. Other things you can do um, are to be careful about creating those ecological traps, such as gravel piles, which are very attractive to nesting females, but are no use for the, the hatchlings. Um, so either you don't leave these piles in the first place, don't create them, or if it's the nesting season, uh, don't use this, this gravel during this time because you might accidentally dig up um, nesting turtles. If you work in forestry or if you have a woodlot, you can plan your harvesting activities around about the nesting season so you don't accidentally um, destroy any, any nests. So the nesting season is generally from around May 15th to July 15th. And it's also a really good idea to maintain the natural vegetation and also the forest canopy around your water courses. For um, agriculture, you can, if you are mow hay, if you have hay, you can set your disc mowers to higher than 15 centimeters. And this way you'll avoid any turtles that are there and also any other species at risk. Um, in the same vein, you can use a flushing bar when you're mowing and this would um, let you know what's there before you hit it. Again, maintaining natural vegetation around water bodies makes a big difference because this is the habitat that the turtles are using. And it's also a good idea to practice nutrient management strategies that prevent fertilizer and manure and lots of extra nutrients entering the water course. Finally, if you're out and about around turtle habitat or you know there are turtles there, make sure you drive cautiously. And if you see a turtle on the road, you can stop and you can pick it up and you can move it off. You just, um, for painted turtles and blandings and wood turtles, you just hold them um, by the sides of their shell and you pick them up and you move them in the direction that they were traveling and you just place them off the road. Snapping turtles are a little more difficult because they have that big beak. Um, so there's a really good video on YouTube that I would recommend, which was by the Toronto Zoo and it's called How to Help a Snapping Turtle Cross the Road. And they have some really good uh, tips and tricks like you can take your car mat from your car and you can slide the snapping turtle on there and drag it across so you don't have to get too close to that beat. If you're in the ATV community, be sure to stay on designated and off-road trails and avoid driving through sensitive wetland habitats so you're not accidentally um, squashing any hatchlings. Also, you can tell your friends and your families and your neighbours what you're doing for species at risk and how they can help. And finally, hopefully, you learned how to recognise these turtle species. So if you see them, it's a good idea to take a, a record of where you were. You can take a picture, if you're lucky, of, your, of the turtle that you see and how many you see or if they're doing anything interesting. And then you can report these sightings. And once you report them, eventually these records will get back to the Nature Trust and other environmental organizations, and then we can help to protect this land and protect these turtle species. So, I 
I think that's the end of my presentation. Is there any questions that I can answer for you guys? We have had some really good questions in the chat. Uh, sorry, not in the chat, in the actual question and answer section. We've got two people who are raising their hands. Cool. So let me figure out how to give you permission to speak. All right, Nancy Smith, go ahead. Uh, you are on mute, though. There you go. Uh, yeah, um, I was asking about the turtles in the Annapolis Royal Pond on the Marsh Trail. Um, we haven't seen them in the last year because there, there was an increase in water level. I'm not quite sure why. And it appears there are no more uh, places for them to bask in the sun. So do you know what kind of turtles there are and what could be done to improve the situation? Um, I think it would be a mix of turtle species. I think Joanna may know more about this one than I do because she'd be more familiar with the area. Do you have any? I, I would just be guessing for that particular pond because I'm not familiar with the area, but there are wood turtles along that in the valley and there are painted turtles there as well. But that kind of environment sounds like a painted turtle sort of situation. They're um, more widespread and, and less fussy about where they bask. But I don't know, sorry, Nancy, in terms of the specific uh, pond, I, no, I don't know what happened to the turtles. And do you know, have you anything to suggest in terms of ways to reinstate uh, basking areas? Uh, well, most turtles, well, I, I, it does somewhat species dependent, but um, painted turtles, often prefer floating logs or, or rocks along the edge of the shore with a bit of vegetation they can hide under. So if th those things aren't available, then you could make them available. Um, other species like Blandings and wood turtle really like um, basking in alders. So if there's an opportunity to plant alders along the edge, that's often very safe feeling habitat for a number of turtle species. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Ron, your turn. There, am I unmuted? You are unmuted, go ahead. Okay, thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you. I have two, two questions. One is in certain parts of the states and maybe even Ontario, the uh, snapping turtle was, uh, was hunted for food. Do you know if there's any hunting, if, if there was any uh, food use history in, in Nova Scotia for the snapping turtle? Um, I know that they were, it was legal to harvest snapping turtles up until 2008 and since then it's been illegal. So I wouldn't be surprised if they were used if, as food, yes. Okay, thank you. Make easy soup. <laughs> as, you know, people, easy food was, people went for it. So I would expect, yeah, it was a thing. <laughs> uh, my, my other question is the red-eared slider. Uh, are you aware of, there's a, a number of records, especially in the Halifax metro area, there's about 47 uh, records on, on iNaturalist. Are you uh, aware of any efforts to uh, control or maybe eliminate that population? Um, I, uh, I'm not aware of any projects at the moment. Joanna may know otherwise. No, as far as I know, there isn't a project to eliminate them other than, you know, if you contact a DNR office and say, I found a red-eared slider, I'm pretty sure they'll take it, but there's no concerted effort to go after them. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Sherry, your turn. Hello, everybody. Um, a few years ago, we found a spot by our lake where a snapping turtle, we think, um, nested and then something came and dug up all the eggs and they were all torn apart. So I have a couple questions. I'm wondering if turtles like to return to the same place to nest or if they will just kind of move around and kind of if so, how far of an area would they be nesting in? And if we were to find another spot where they had laid eggs without the permit that you mentioned for protecting the nest, is there anything else that we could do to keep raccoons or whatever other predators gotten, gotten to the nest from doing that again? 
are site specific um, in their nesting habitat, so they do return um, to nesting sites, yes. Um, I don't know if there's anything you can do for the snapping turtle nest um, because you do require a species at risk permit to do anything with them. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Unless anybody has any other suggestions. I know the, the permit thing's a bit of a sticking point for the nest protectors because a lot of people mm -hmm. want to use them, but the uh, that's currently what the rules are and the laws are. So, um, and outside of that, I don't have any good suggestions. Hey, thank you. That makes sense. You're welcome. Well, I don't see any more hands up. Have we gotten to all the questions in the chat here? I'm answering as I go, but. For those who are asking questions about getting uh, involved, that's worth answering abroad too. Uh, it depends where you live in the province, but there are a number of organizations that take volunteers. So MTRI certainly takes volunteers. Um, if you, and even if you say, spend part of your summer vacation at Keji, then um, there's programs you may be able to get involved with there. Everything's COVID dependent, of course, but there's no harm in checking. Um, the Clean Annapolis River Project in the Valley does a fair amount of work with wood turtle, and I believe they take volunteers. Um, and then now the, the St. Mary's River Association is turning its attention to wood turtles, but do not have, they have a volunteer program for their association, but I'm not certain if it includes turtle work yet, although I think they would like it to. Um, and that's, that's not exhaustive, certainly. Um, and then we always need property guardians, volunteers on properties, including properties where there are turtles. And we love hearing about records. So if you're interested in volunteering, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, we would. Oh, yes, I should, as someone else has put in the chat, but I should mention as well, there is um, a citizen science group called Turtle Patrol which does some work and um, they keep an eye on nests sometimes. And when they hatch in the fall, they'll be there ready to kind of hover over the nestlings as they make their way to the nearest body of water. So that's, that's one answer to the nest question. Um, and they have a fair number of good educational resources too. So you may want to look them up. Well, Janine. Okay. We're almost, we're just on 7 p.m. Um, thank you all for joining us today. I hope you learned something a little bit useful about turtles. Um, yeah, okay. Thank you so much.